Welcome everyone and this is lecture 45 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. This series accompanies my book Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book on Amazon. Please click on the link below. This is our last lecture on hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. As usual, we are going to end with case studies. Case number one. Here we have severe hypercalcemia. 59-year-old woman with a known history of squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, which is a known cause for severe hypercalcemia. She presents with nausea, vomiting, weakness, constipation, abdominal pain, dehydration, polyuria, the usual symptoms of severe hypercalcemia, sodium-144 because she's a little bit dehydrated, potassium-3.4 because of the polyuria, calcium is 16.3, so this is severe hypercalcemia, it's over 14, creatinine 1.9, probably from dehydration, magnesium 1.9, normal, phosphate is 4.6 also normal, slightly elevated. How would you manage this patient with severe hypercalcemia? Like we said, uh, most of these patients with the severe hypercalcemia have malignancy here. We have the diagnosis already, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. Now we should treat the patient immediately with what? With saline, okay? So this patient is dehydrated, she's polyuric, she has elevation in sodium and in creatinine, so we are going to hydrate with 0.9 normal saline. Furosemide we're not going to use until possibly later if we get into hypervolemia. She's, she's currently dehydrated. If you give furosemide, she's going to get worse. Bisphosphonate is usually necessary in these cases. It is severe. Uh, but since creatinine is elevated, you have to be cautious. So like we said, we can use uh, zolindronic acid or Zometa, maybe 2 milligrams over uh, 2 to 4 hours, rather than the usual 4 milligrams over 15 minutes. Uh, alternatively, you can use uh, pimidronate, 60 milligrams, also infused slowly over uh, 2 to 4 hours. Uh, probably in this case, 30 milligrams uh, would be more appropriate than uh, 60 milligrams. So how do we treat? Hydrate and then give bisphosphonate. Case number two, asymptomatic hypercalcemia. 43-year-old woman found to have a calcium of 11.1 on a re routine lamp. Kidney function, electrolytes are all normal. We don't have osteoporosis. We don't have nephrolithiasis. We went ahead and we did a 24-hour urine collection, and urine calcium is actually low. It's only 21 milligrams. PTH, well, normal up to 50, 55. It's slightly elevated, 60. We checked 25 hydroxy cd to see if there's any... 25 uh, hydroxy D toxicity is 31, um, which is normal. 30 to 80 is normal. She's not on a thiazide. There's no immobility. So what, what do we do here? Um, do we have a primary hyperparathyroidism? Because PTH is a, a little bit high. Do we need to search for a parathyroid adenoma? Do we need to send her to a surgeon? What do we do? Well, this presentation is not consistent with primary hyperparathyroidism. Why? Well, first, you don't have any symptoms. You have nothing. You don't have nephrolithiasis, isoporosis, and urine calcium is low. In primary hyperpara, it should be elevated. We should suspect familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which is due, like we said, inactivating mutations in the calcium sensing receptor, especially since you have mild hypercalcemia, you have no symptoms, and you have a mild elevation in PTH. How do, you make, how do you make the diagnosis? You need genetic testing, maybe uh, test other family members. And uh, what do we need for management? Nothing, just monitor calcium every uh, six months. In this patient, intact PTH and 24-hour uh, 24 urine calcium were done on an annual basis. You could also do uh, just a random spot urine for uh, uh, calcium and creatinine. And if it stays below 0 0.02, then um, the, the, you're fine. The diagnosis would still be consistent with FHH. Uh, this patient was filed for three years, and there was no changing in her condition. Um, and, uh, of course, she was not sent uh, for surgery. Case number three, severe secondary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary, not primary. When do we see that? Well, usually in renal patients. 45-year-old man, history of end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis for eight years. 
PTH is a whopping 2,235. I mean, believe me, you're not going to see 2,235 in a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism. This is only dialysis patients with secondary severe hyperparathyroidism. Now, the patient did not respond to vitamin D analogs and calcium mimetics. At this level, um, you have nodular hyperplasia of the parathyroids, and they're not going to respond to anything. You might ask why. Actually, when you have nodular hyperplasia, you don't have vitamin D receptors and uh, calcium sensing receptors in these nodules anymore. So they're not expected to respond. However, you have to try it. Some patients do respond, but uh, many of them at this level, uh, they're not going to respond. So this patient was sent for surgery and three and a half glands were removed. Um, what do you do with the other half? Well, either you leave it in place like some surgeons do, or some put it in the arm or the thigh in case they have to go back again and do some surgery. This, this way they don't have to do neck exploration. Surgeons who don't do that, they don't like it because uh, if the implantation, if the auto implantation in the arm or the thigh is unsuccessful, then you have total parathyroidectomy and lifelong severe hypocalcemia. Six hours post-operatively, serum calcium was 6.1, ionized calcium 3, magnesium 1.4, phosphate was 6. Now, what do you do for the management of hypocalcemia? Here we have severe post-operative, not hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia. This is a classic case of hungry bone syndrome, okay? So this patient's bones have been deprived of calcium for a long time. Once you do a parathyroidectomy, you remove the effect of PTH. Now, the bones want to reclaim all that calcium, also magnesium and phosphorus. So you are going to have severe hypocalcemia. Now, the easiest way to do it is to start them on a calcium gluconate drip. Otherwise, you'll be up all night just giving one gram of calcium gluconate after the other. So this is how, how I would do it. We have severe hypocalcemia postoperative for uh, parathyroidectomy, they are going to put 10 grams of calcium gluconate in a liter of 0.9 normal saline. Now, give the patient 100 mLs an hour or one gram of calcium gluconate per hour. Then check calcium every four hours and adjust the rate up or down as needed. Now, in the meantime, start the patient on oral calcium carbonate because they are going to go home on oral. How much? Well, a gram every four to six hours, and start them on calcitriol high dose, not the usual 0.25 microgram, uh, one microgram PO daily. You also replace magnesium, you replace phosphate if needed. Now increase, if you're a nephrologist, calcium in the dialysate. In this case, it was increased from 2.5 to 3. There is a recent study suggesting starting calcitriol early, even before surgery, a few days before surgery, and this may help in preventing severe hypocalcemia. Now, the patient was discharged on oral calcium and calcitriol three days later. Now, you have to know that sometimes for months and weeks, you have to use high doses of calcium carbonate and calcitriol to combat this hypocalcemia. Case number four, primary hypoparathyroidism. Here we have a 55-year-old woman presenting with chronic hypocalcemia. Calcium 6.5, ionized 3.2, so it is confirmed due to primary hypoparathyroidism. Intact PTH level is 8, serum phosphate is 3, serum magnesium 1.9, 25-hydroxy-D is low 80. How would you manage this patient with primary hypoparathyroidism? We should keep serum calcium at the low normal range, okay? If you make it normal, you are going to end up with nephrolithiasis. We should encourage a high calcium diet, milk, yogurt, we should replace vitamin D. This patient was placed on calcium carbonate, 1,000 milligrams PO every six hours, and calcitriol, 0.5 microgram daily. Vitamin D was replaced with D2. Ergocalciferol, 1.25 milligrams weekly for 24 weeks, then monthly. One month later, calcium was 8. So this is a little bit low, but that's fine. You don't want it higher than that. Phosphate was 3.1. And the patient was kept on the same regimen. You follow her every three months, and that's about it. Case number five, hypocalcemia in a hemodialysis patient. A 65-year-old hemodialysis patient was found to have calcium of 6.8, ionized 3.3 milligram per deciliter on her monthly lamps. 
Previous month, her calcium was 9.1. She indicated that her rheumatologist has given her something, a subcutaneous injection for severe osteoporosis. How would you manage her hypocalcemia? Well, it turned out that her rheumatologist gave her prolia, denosumab, for osteoporosis. This is, like we said, fully human monoclonal antibody that targets receptor activator of the NF-kappa B ligand, rank ligand. Now, especially in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, denosumab can cause severe hypocalcemia. So um, I gave the patient oral calcium carbonate. I increased the dialysis path from 2.5 to 3 and uh, started the patient on calcitriol. Uh, her calcitriol dose was uh, 0 0.25 here. Uh, it was increased to 1 microgram daily. And the hypocalcium re resolved after 3 weeks. After that, uh, uh, the calcium bath was lowered back to 2.5 and the calcitriol was lowered back to 0 0.25 microgram daily. Let's end with key points regarding hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. We have three calcium regulating hormonal systems, the parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, and calcitonin. Calcium sensing receptor plays a critical role in calcium homeostasis. Calcium level is maintained by an interplay between these three hormones and also the bowel, which absorb calcium, the kidneys, which do calcium absorption and excretion, and the bones, Bones take calcium, so you have calcium uptake and calcium release. The most common causes of hypocalcemia are PTH and vitamin D deficiencies, while most common causes of hypercalcemia, again, are primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancies. Hypercalcemia is frequently encountered in malignancies and it carries poor prognosis. Aggressive hydration and bisphosphonates are the basis of treatment. Finally, hypocalcemia is managed with replacement of calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium if needed. Excessive replacement of calcium and vitamin D should be avoided.